right, well, I want to welcome you to uh, say thank you for coming to uh, Spring Lecture for the Center for Early Christian Studies. Uh, Matt and I have been talking about this for some time, so I'm very grateful that he drove down this morning uh, from Oklahoma to, uh, to uh, be here with us. This, uh, this lecture is something, is part of a larger project. I'll let him, he'll, he'll discuss it probably at the beginning. And uh, on the nature of Christ, uh, Christ descent, and understanding the history, theology, and, and uh, biblical basis for that, uh, for that view. Uh, I know Matt is known to many of you, but uh, received his PhD from Southeastern. Uh, is currently the Dickinson Associate Professor of Religion, Director of Master of Arts, Christian Studies, and Intercultural Studies at OBU, Oklahoma Baptist University. Several books, including Between the Cross and the Throne, Reading Revelation, Story of Scripture, Introduction to Biblical Theology. Uh, the title of his paper is The One Who Trampled Hades Underfoot, A Comparative Analysis of Christ's Ascent to the Dead and Trinitarian Relations in Second Century Christian Texts and uh, Von Balthasar. All right? Let's welcome Matt. Thanks very much, Stephen, for that introduction, and, and thanks so much for inviting me down. Uh, this is my first time to Fort Worth and to Southwestern's campus, but I think this means that I've visited all six seminaries now, or at least driven past them. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to be here this morning with you. I'm working on a book, uh, as Stephen mentioned, on Christ's descent to the dead. This essay is not part of that book. Uh, it's actually a, a separate essay that I wrote, sort of taking research that I had done for the book that wasn't usable in the book, and then turning it into a, an essay. Uh, I should say that if you would like to cite this, it will be published in a forthcoming issue of the Scottish Journal of Theology. I don't know exactly which issue it will be, uh, but it will be published. And so if you want to cite it, it'll be out. Uh, and if it's for your research, I'm happy to uh, send you a hard copy. Just make sure that you, you cite that, please, uh, according to, to the information I just gave you. Um, so let me dive right in then, and then afterward we can talk about anything you want. We can talk about the essay, we can talk about the descent, we can talk about Auburn football, I guess, if you really want to talk about that. I am an Auburn grad, so I'm sad all the time. Uh, so <clears throat> Hans Urs von Balthasar says of Christ's descent to the dead in one section of Theodrama 4 that, and I quote, Jesus does experience the darkness of the sinful state, not in the same way as the God-hating sinner experience it, unless the sinner has spared such experience, but nonetheless in a deeper and darker experience. This is because it takes place in the profound depths of the relations between the div divine hypostases, which are inaccessible to any creature. In the immediately preceding paragraph, Balthazar says of the, quote, hour, a synonym in his work for the passion, and especially the, the descent, quote, here the God drama reaches its acme, Perverse, finite freedom casts all its guilt onto God, making him the sole accused, the scapegoat. While God allows himself to be thoroughly affected by this, not only in the humanity of Christ, but also in Christ's Trinitarian mission. The omnipotent powerlessness of God's love shines forth in the mystery of darkness and alienation between God and the sin-bearing Son. Balthazar here claims that in Christ's descent, his experience of the state of death between his crucifixion and resurrection, that Jesus endures separation from God in a way that no other human being can. That is, separation between the divine hypostases of Father and Son. This separation is predicated on the God-man's experience of the poena damni and the accompanying visio mortis, an experience that necessitates the non-Nestorian participation of the divine nature of the Son. In experiencing this existential separation from the Father, and because that separation is bridged via the love of the Spirit, Jesus, qua divinity, heals the divide between God and man created by sin. In other words, Balthazar argues that the Son experiences sin separation from God in hell, qua divinity, and in doing so, saves humanity from that divide. Aidan Nichols shares this interpretation of Balthazar's thought on the descent, saying, and I quote again, The descent demonstrates the costliness of our redemption. The divine Son underwent the experiences of godless, godlessness. It shows that the God revealed by the Redeemer is a trinity, a trinity. Only if the Spirit, 
as vinculum amoris, between the father and the son, can re-relate father and son in their estrangement in the descent, can the unity of the revealed and revealer be maintained. We should finally mention that Balthazar's view may imply that, because Christ apparently experiences the descent primarily qua divinity, his humanity, that is, his incarnate state, is stripped away, or at least minimized in importance. Here we need to quote Balthazar at length again, as it is in the following description of the continuity of the hypostatic union during the descent that Balthazar draws together the Trinitarian and Christological implications of his view of Holy Saturday. He says, and this is a lengthy quote, so bear with me. If man is the living and mortal being composed of body and spirit in a unity whom we know, and if this man ceases to be in death, whatever might become of him after death, then Jesus has gone to the end of his being human. And, having become human, he has gone to the limits of his surrender of himself. And in his being dead with the dead, the attitude and stance of the divine Logos has been stripped away, as it were. For it was in the extremities of, it, of this death that the Logos found the adequate expression of this divine stance letting himself remain available for the Father in everything, even in the ultimate alienation. The stripping away of the man Jesus is the laying bare, not only of Sheol, but also of the Trinitarian relationship in which the Son is entirely the one who springs forth from the Father. Holy Saturday is thus a kind of suspension, as it were, of the Incarnation whose result is given back to the hands of the Father, and which the Father will renew and definitively confirm by the Easter resurrection. End quote. Some theologians, most notably Alyssa Pitstick, have thoroughly critiqued Baltazar's position in recent years. One of Pitstick's primary charges is that Baltazar's position is not consistent with the Roman Catholic tradition, of which they are both a part, and particularly with papal decrees on the subject. Baltazar, on the other hand, consistently claims that his view is in accord with that tradition. This essay does not intend to wade into the inter-Roman debate, at least in terms of whether or not Balthazar's position is in line with Roman Catholic orthodoxy. Rather, I hope to address a lacuna in the assessment of Balthazar's position, namely whether or not his claim that the dissensus results in an existential separation between the hypostases of father and son can be described as traditional in light of some of the earliest sources on the dissent. While we could assess this claim via comparison with any number of eras of Christian dogmatic inquiry, here our focus will remain on second century writers' views of, this, of the descent and how they relate it to Christ's person and work. We have chosen to focus on the second century because it stands at the fountainhead of Christian doctrinal inquiry. Our guiding questions include, then, the following. Did second century Christian writers posit, as Balthazar does, that Christ's descent is his experience of sin's torment qua divinity. Does this event in Christ's work introduce existential separation between the first and second persons of the Trinity? In other words, how closely does Balthazar's position actually come to second century reflection on the nature of God and his work, particularly in the descent? I will argue in what follows that the second century texts under consideration discussed Christ's descent and its effectiveness with respect to both the human and divine natures of Jesus, and therefore the entire Godhead's participation in the act of descent. Contrary to Balthazar, however, for second century writers, the descent is not an event that separates the divine hypostases of Father and Son, but rather a part of the one redemptive act accomplished by the one God through the incarnate Son. This claim will be supported through exploring multiple second century texts from three groups of writers, the Apostolic Fathers, 2nd century Jewish and Christian traditions, and the 2nd century apologists. I'll also finally explore the descent in Melito's Peripasca. So first, uh, under consideration, the apostolic fathers. What do they say about the descent? There are a number of attestations to Christ's descent to the dead in the apostolic fathers, particularly in Ignatius and in Polycarp. Regarding the former, Ignatius's letter to the Trallians, 9, 1 through 2, refers to Christ, quote, who really was crucified, and died, while those in heaven and on earth and under the earth looked on, who moreover really was raised from the dead when his father raised him up. Notice the key part of this in, in, for our consideration is those under the earth who looked on at Christ's redeeming work 
and that it is uh, in Greek, apon nekron, from the dead, that Christ was raised. These two phrases, those under the earth and from the dead, uh, appear to be parallel in this passage in Ignatius, in that the first clause descends from heaven to earth to those under the earth, and the second begins with Christ coming up from the dead and being raised up. Further, further, apa or ek necron was a common phrase used by early Christian writers, including New Testament authors, to refer to the place of the dead or dead ones given its participial structure. So, just brief, brief pause here. Uh, the, the participial structure of, of necros there, necron, is, uh, you can translate it, in, and it should be translated in various places in the New Testament as fr among or from the dead ones. This makes it likely that in this passage, as well as others that use this phrase uh, in Ignatius, such as uh, Letter to the Magnesians 9.2, Ignatius is referring not just to Christ's bodily resurrection, although he is referring to that, but also to his being raised from among the dead ones. In other words, between his crucifixion and resurrection, Christ was in the place of the dead ones. And in his resurrection, he was brought out of it. One other potentially relevant passage in the Ignatian corpus is his letter to the Ephesians 18.2. Here Ignatius says, quote, For our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived by Mary according to God's plan, both from the seed of David and of the Holy Spirit. He was born and baptized in order that by his suffering he might cleanse the water. He goes on to place what he calls three mysteries, virginity, birth, and death, together, making it likely that 18.2 is also a conflation of the incarnation and descent to the dead. This is not uncommon. Uh, we also see it in Ascension of Isaiah and the teachings of Silvanus. Early Christian writers often drew parallels between the waters of Mary's womb, Jesus' baptism, and Jesus' descent to the dead. In fact, uh, in the similitudes of the shepherd of Hermas in 9.16, one of the other remaining instances of the descent motif in the Apostolic Fathers also refers to the descent to the dead as a baptism into the waters of the dead. If then the phrase, quote, by his suffering he might cleanse the water is a reference to Christ's crucifixion and subsequent descent, we have in Ignatius a clear reference to both Christ's divinity and humanity, I'll again remind you, he says, for our God, Jesus the Christ, coupled with the descent. Even if you don't take this as a reference to the descent, though, Ignatius' other letters affirm Christ's divinity, and then in both his divine and human natures, the person of Jesus accomplished redemption through his entire work, his life, death, descent to the dead, and resurrection. Thus, we are on strong grounds in claiming that Ignatius' view of Christ's work, including his descent, is one in which both, uh, both Christ's divine and human natures participate. There isn't this kind of tension between the two natures as there is in Balthazar. We also have an Ignatius distinctions between Father, Son, and Spirit, indicating that the Son's accomplishment of redemption as the incarnate Christ is not a modalistic or Ebionite construction, but rather one in which the Son is God, along with Father and Spirit, in which there is only one God. While it would be anachronistic to say that Ignatius has in view the hypostatic union and the full-fledged 4th century doctrine of the Trinity, uh, we do find seeds of both of these doctrines in his letters, including in his descriptions of Christ's descent to the dead. Aside from the one mention in Hermas that I already discussed, the only other explicit mention of the descent in the Apostolic Fathers is Polycarp's letter to the Philippians uh, 1.2. Here Polycarp alludes to Acts 2.24, a passage about Christ's time in Hades, when he says, quote, I also rejoice because your firmly rooted faith, renowned from the earliest times, still perseveres and bears fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who endured for our sins, facing even death, whom God raised up, having loosed the birth pangs of Hades. End quote. It is possible that Polycarp's use of ek necron in a later passage, 2.1 through 2, are also references to the descent, but this is unclear in the context of that particular passage. In any case, there is no clear connection here or elsewhere between seeds of the doctrine of the Trinity and the descent doctrine. In the Apostolic Fathers' Corpus, therefore, we're left with Ignatius to help us formulate connections between these two doctrines. And even there, we are only able to make tentative conclusions, namely that Ignatius affirms the descent as part of Christ's whole work, and elsewhere, Ignatius affirms that Christ's work is carried out in both his divine and human natures. When we come to the second group of texts, though, we find a little bit more 
uh, clear data. So second century Jewish and Christian traditions is the second group of texts I'll discuss. Other second century Christian works besides the apostolic fathers also begin to flesh out both the descent doctrine and its relation to the doctrine of God. These include New Testament Apocrypha and Christian interpolations into Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, uh, for instance, the Odes of Solomon. Regarding the former, that is, New Testament Apocrypha, while most of the apocryphal works mention the descent, some of these do so relatively briefly and without clear reference to Christ's divinity. An example of this would be Gospel of Peter 10, 41-42, which briefly mentions Christ preaching to the dead between his death and resurrection. There's no real exploration of that, it's just he did it. Uh, likewise, in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, there are a few brief mentions of Christ's descent, and if you want a list of them, I can give them to you afterward. Uh, and here, all we're seeing really is glimpses of both what early Christians thought about the descent, as well as how they related it to their doctrine of, the, of God. In all three of these passages, in, uh, in uh, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, they're concerned with Christ ascending from Hades. And in both the Testament of Dan and the Testament of Asher, uh, these passages are, are focused on Christ's war with and victory over Hades and Satan during or in his descent. The Testament of Dan also proclaims that Christ in his descent took the souls of the righteous to Eden. And most importantly for our purposes today, both Testament of Dan and Testament of Asher uh, both refer in this context to, to Christ as God. There's a very clear reference to what's going on in the descent, as well as referring to Christ as God in the descent, as well as, as human. The Odes of Solomon paint a similar picture. And again, if you want a list of texts, I can give them to you uh, for sake of time and also your handwriting. Uh, I'm not going to just list those out right now, but if you want me to come back to it, I will. There are uh, at least five to six passages that speak of the Messiah's descent to and overthrow of Hades in the Odes of Solomon. Odes of Solomon 42.11 is characteristic of those handful of passages, and it reads this way, quote, Sheol saw me and was shattered, and death ejected me and many with me. We once again see Christ descending to the underworld, defeating death in Hades, and leaving with, quote, many. None of these odes, and, and again, we can list them later, clearly present Christ as divine, although he is portrayed, portrayed elsewhere, as divine in some of the other odes of Solomon, just not the ones that talk about the descent. It is difficult then to draw any concrete conclusions from Gospel of Peter, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, or the Odes of Solomon regarding this explicit connection between the doctrine of God and the descent. We've seen in the Apostolic Fathers, and here we see again in these particular apocryphal and pseudepigraphal interpolations that they discuss both of those things, doctrine of God, along with the descent but they don't clearly connect them in the way that we need uh, somebody to connect them together to, to either confirm or confront Baltazar's interpretation. But that kind of connection becomes much clearer when we look elsewhere in the apocryphal books. For instance, teachings of Silvanus, 103, 23 through 104, 14, says this, and I'm going to quote at length, O soul, persistent one, in what ignorance you exist. Those people back then were really kind. Uh, for who is your guide into the darkness? How many likenesses did Christ take on because of you? Although he was God, he was found among men as a man. He descended to the underworld. He released the children of death. They were in travail, as the scripture of God has said. And he sealed up the very heart of it, that is the underworld. And he broke the underworld's strong bows completely. And when all the powers had seen him, they fled, so that he might bring you, wretched one, up from the abyss, and might die for you as a ransom for your sin. Penal substitution in the fathers, by the way. Neither here nor there for this paper, but FYI. He saved you from the strong hand of the underworld. Later in teaching of Silvanus, 110, 14 through 111, 4, he says again, uh, quote, Know who Christ is, and acquire him as a friend, for this is the friend who is faithful. He is also God and teacher. This is, this is the key quote here. This one, being God, became man for your sake. It is this one who broke the iron bars of the underworld and the bronze bolts. It is this one who attacked and cast down every haughty tyrant. 
It is he who loosened from himself the chains of which he had taken hold. He brought up the poor from the abyss and the mourners from the underworld. It is he who humbled the haughty powers. He who put to shame haughtiness through humility. He who has cast down the strong and the boaster through weakness. He who, in contempt, scorned that which is considered an honor, so that humility for God's sake might be highly exalted. And he who has put on humanity. In both of these texts, the author, highly dependent upon Scripture, namely Psalm 107, which is, uh, and, and for him it was uh, Psalm, 106, uh, Psalm 107 in the Septuagint, which for us is Psalm 106. Uh, the author portrays the descent as an act in which Christ overthrows Satan and Hades via concealing his divinity in his humanity. This incarnate appearance in Hades is not Gnostic or Docetic, but real. And it allows Christ to enter Hades disguised so as to defeat it. That's a very clear text relating the doctrine of God and the hypostatic union to Christ's work in the descent. But perhaps the clearest picture in the apocryphal text of Christ descending in his incarnate divinity to Hades and achieving victory, not torment, comes in Ascension of Isaiah 10, 7-11, and 11, 19. And I, you know, we can, I can list all these texts again if you need them. Here the author describes, quote, And I heard the voice of the Most High, the Father of my Lord, saying to my Lord Christ, who will be called Jesus, Go forth and descend through all the heavens, and thou wilt descend to the firmament and that world. To the angel in Sheol thou wilt descend. This is very important. But to Haguel thou wilt not go. And thou wilt become like unto the flesh, or like unto the likeness of all who are in the five heavens. And thou wilt be careful to become like the form of the angels, of the firmament, and the angels also are in Sheol. And none of the angels of that world shall know that thou art with me, of the seven heavens and of their angels. And after this the adversary envied him and roused the children of Israel against him, not knowing who he was, and they delivered him to the king and crucified him, and he descended to the angel of Sheol. In the context of the rest of the book, Ascension of Isaiah, the Lord Christ is clearly presented as God whether through the triune confession of 8.18, the worship of all three persons in 9.28-42, or the seating of the Son to the right of the Spirit and on the right hand of God in 11.23-42. The three persons of Son, Spirit, and God share in their people's confession, receive their people's worship, and exercise authority equally. Further, Ascension of Isaiah presents the descent as effective precisely because Christ's divine nature is hidden from view of Satan and his fallen angels. Christ is able to descend into Hades and thereby thereby defeat death because neither Satan nor Hades recognizes him as God because he retains, in other words, his humanity. A final set of texts uh, for our purposes is the early Christian apologists. So we've talked about the apostolic fathers. Uh, They talk about the descent. They talk about the doctrine of God. They don't really relate the two together very clearly. Now we've talked about some apocryphal and uh, pseudepigraphal interpolations that the situation becomes much clearer when we talk about Ascension of Isaiah uh, and teachings of Silvanus. And now we come to our final set of texts, which is the early Christian apologists. In the early Christian apologists, the link between the descent and the doctrine of God is explicit. We no longer have to do this kind of uh, piecing together. Both Justin Martyr and Irenaeus quote the Apocryphon of Jeremiah uh, in Dialogue with Trypho 72, Justin quotes it as saying, quote, The Lord remembered his dead people of Israel who were in their graves, and he descended to preach to them his own salvation. Irenaeus quotes it similarly, similarly in Against Heresies, uh, books 3 and 4, as well as Demonstration 78. Although in Irenaeus' quotations there is an added reference to not only the preaching of salvation, but also deliverance from Hades. Key point to make here is that both Justin and Irenaeus quote this text to indicate that Christ descended to the dead as the incarnate God-man. It is worth quoting Irenaeus at length, this is against heresies uh, 3.20.4, to see this connection between the victory achieved in Christ's descent and his divinity. Again, that it should not be a mere man who should save us, nor one without flesh, for the angels are without flesh. The same prophet announced, saying, Neither an elder nor angel, but the Lord himself will spare them. He will himself set them free. And that he should himself become very man, visible. 
when he should be the word giving salvation, Isaiah again says, Behold, city of Zion, thine eyes shall see salvation. And that it was not a mere man who died for us, Isaiah says, And the Holy Lord remembered his dead Israel, who had slept in the land of the sepulcher. And he came down to preach his salvation to them that he might save them. Notice here that it is precisely because Christ descends as the, incarnation, uh, as the incarnate one of God, the word, that his descent is victorious. Irenaeus highlights both of these aspects, the incarnation of the divine person of the word and the continuation of the incarnation of the descent as crucial to the effectiveness of the work accomplished in the descent. Uh, one final text worth mentioning that does not fall neatly into any of those three categories is Melito of Sardis's Peripasca. This second century text mentions the descent a number of times in its explication of the Passover and the Passover's Christological meaning. Melito also begins with this very clear articulation of Christ's humanity and divinity in verse 8. Quote, For the one who was born a son and led to slaughter as a lamb and sacrificed as a sheep and buried as a man rose up from the dead as God, since he is by nature both God and man. So Melito's description of Christ's work and what follows is dependent upon this assumption of Christ's existence and work as both God and man. Melito lays groundwork for discussing Christ's descent in verses 55 and 56 of the song, where in explaining the effect of the fall and the nature of death, he says, quote, Therefore all flesh fell under the power of sin, and every body under the dominion of death. For every soul was driven out from its house of flesh. Indeed, that which had been taken from the earth was dissolved again into earth, and that which had been given from God, that is the soul, was locked up in Hades. And that beautiful ordered arrangement was dissolved when the beautiful body was separated from the soul. It's not Gnosticism. Yes, man was divided up into parts by death. Yes, an extraordinary misfortune and captivity enveloped him. He was dragged away captive under the shadow of death. And the image of the Father remained there desolate. For this reason, therefore, the mystery of the Passover has been completed in the body of the Lord. Melito here states that at, he, at death, human beings are separated in body and soul. With the body descending to the grave, and he says it uh, in, in, in a way where he talks about the, uh, that was taken from the earth was dissolved again into the earth. So the body goes into the grave, uh, and the soul descends into Hades, the place of the dead. This explanation is important for understanding how Melito conceives of Christ's own death and, de and descent, which he men mentions explicitly twice. First, in verses 70 through 71, Melito says, quote, This is the one who became human in a virgin, who was hanged on the tree, who was buried in the earth, who was resurrected from among the dead, and who raised mankind up out of the grave below to the heights of heaven. This is the lamb that was slain. This is the lamb that was silent. This is the one who was born of Mary, that beautiful ewe lamb. This is the one who was taken from the flock and was dragged to sacrifice and was killed in the evening and was buried at night. The one who was not broken while on the tree, who did not see dissolution while on the earth, who rose up from the dead, and who raised up mankind from the grave below. Similarly, in 101-102, Melito proclaims, He rose up from the dead and cried aloud with his voice, Who is he who contends with me? Let him stand in opposition to me. I set the condemned man free. I gave the dead man life. I raised up the one who has been entombed. Who is my opponent? I, he says, am the Christ. I am the one who destroyed death and triumphed over the enemy and trampled Hades underfoot and bound the strong one and carried off man to the heights of heaven. I, he says, am the Christ. These lines, that show, these lines show that Melito believes that Christ in his death descended to the realm of the dead. Hades, in order to achieve victory over it and over Satan, the strong one, so that he might deliver his people from death. Further, if we take these verses in the context of what Melito says earlier in verse 8, we can confidently say that Melito here pictures Christ dying and experiencing death in his humanity, but achieving victory over death via his exaltation, beginning with the descent and moving through the resurrection and ascension, precisely because of his divinity. In his humanity, per the earlier verses we read about bodily death, and, and, or human death, body and soul, Christ experienced death as all other humans do. His body descended to the grave and his soul descended to Hades. But Christ's descent is unique in that his humanity is united to his divinity. 
And thus this descent is not just like any other death, but is a death-defeating death and a victorious one. The portrait of the descent in Melito is thus in line with what we've already seen, uh, although in Noose, in the Apologists and Apocrypha, and then later more explicitly with the Apostolic Fathers. Christ's descent is effective precisely because he is both God and man. So how do we analyze these texts theologically and then talk about how it's related to Baltazar? And I'll, I'll say this by way of conclusion, although this, this is a bit uh, lengthy. <clears throat> so I don't want you to think I'm going to be done in a minute. I'm not. It's going to take me a while to get through this last section, but it is the sort of what we're moving towards. Given these various statements about the descent by early Christian writers, is there a coherent picture presented regarding how this doctrine relates to the doctrine of God and the doctrine of the Trinity more particularly? While we should avoid anachronisms in answering this question, we can also safely note a number of ways in which the statements explored serve as catalysts for and precursors of later pro-Nicene Trinitarian thought. First, with respect to the person of Christ, there is a conceptual, not necessarily chronological, trajectory. Moving from truncated statements that Jesus victoriously descended to the dead and the apostolic fathers to overt and lengthy statements that his descent was effective precisely because he is the God-man, the incarnate one. His incarnate, his incarnate state remains intact. He goes into death both as God and man. Hades let him in and thus allowed his victory because they did not immediately recognize his divinity given his incarnation. Further, this identification of Christ as God is not generally theistic, but specifically Jewish. He is the incarnate Lord who descended into Hades uh, and is the same God of Israel. And this is what Justin and uh, Irenaeus both say in their quotations of Jeremiah and Isaiah. This, of course, is one of the primary impetuses for doctrinal development in the 3rd and 4th centuries, and specifically for the controversies surrounding Paul of Samosota, Arius, and Eunomius, among others. How should the church account for the fact that the New Testament, and for our purposes, these 2nd century descent texts, describe the man Jesus Christ as God? That question, much less any attempt at answering it, is not found in the text explored above. Nevertheless, it is important to note that these kinds of texts are precisely what give rise to later Trinitarian controversies. Another traje trajectory that begins in these texts and continues through the Nicene controversy is the distinction between persons, that is, divine persons. We see this in something as simple as Trinitarian confessions and doxologies, but there are other ways in which the distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit is made. In Ascension of Isaiah, for instance, uh, the Most High of the High Ones is also the one who will be called by the Holy Spirit through the, through the lips of the righteous, uh, the Father of the Lord. So you have in that text the Father, the Spirit, and the Lord, uh, clearly distinguished from one another. Further, it is the Father, the Most High, who sends my Lord Christ, who will be called Jesus into the world, in chapter 10. While we do not have here a clear-cut and explicit affirmation of the doctrines of eternal generation and procession, of course we don't, and while we should not therefore anachronistically import an explicit affirmation of those doctrines onto this text, we should also recognize that what this text does explicitly affirm, namely the equality of Father, Lord, or Son, and Spirit as God, and the sending of the Lord or Son by the Father, are again precisely what gives rise to the doctrine of eternal relations of origin in the 4th century. We should also note here, though, some of the more curious statements by these writers regarding the distinctions between the Father and the Son. And here, this is sort of an aside to make sure we all know that 2nd century doesn't equal 4th century. Uh, Melito says of Jesus in Peri Pascha 105, Jesus is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. A New Testament statement, if there ever was one. But then he continues to say that he bears the Father and is born by the Father, whatever that means. Um, we can also compare this to verse 9, which claims that in in that Jesus begets, he is Father. In that he is begotten, he is Son. So I don't know what that means either. We could add to that Ignatius' statement, uh, statements in Magnesians, that uh, may suggest some kind of temporal procession and recession of the Son from, from and to the Father. Thus, while as there is distinction between Father and Son in these texts, and while Ignatius in particular also affirms the sending of the Son by the Father, there are also in these two writers at least some confusion between how the Father and Son are distinguished from one another. So that's all to say, that, that brief paragraph is all to say just, I'm not trying to equate second century texts with fourth century doctrinal formulations. There are clearly uh, texts in, this, in these second century writers 
that push us forward to Nicaea, but they're also not saying exactly how Nicaea said what they said. Um, and in fact, we would disagree with some of what they said or critique it. A final area in which these second century dissensus texts connect to the doctrine of the Trinity is in their clear and consistent affirmation that Christ descended in his humanity while united to his divinity and that he experienced the sufferings of his, of his humanity while remaining God in every sense. To put it in modern dogmatic terms, and again, this is not attempting to be anachronistic, it's using our terms to describe what's going on. These texts contain seeds that would later flower into the doctrines of the hypostatic union and the extra Calvinisticum. We see this particularly in the disguise motif that comes up a number of times throughout these texts. Most prominent among them was the Ascension of Isaiah text we discussed. That's by no means the only one we could, we could mention. Many of the examples cited above note that Christ's descent was successful precisely because Hades did not recognize Christ for who he truly is, God in human flesh. What this means is that these texts affirm Christ descended in his humanity while still united to his divinity. The descent does not temporarily negate the incarnation. It's about as clear as I can say it, as Balthazar's position implies, or may imply. Rather, it is precisely because of the continuity of the incarnation that the descent is effective. Further, there seems to be a few clear statements that Christ's incarnation does not diminish or put on hold his divinity in any sense. In other words, there does not appear to be suggestions of uh, canonic Christology or other kinds of canonicism in these texts. And that's very important for Balthazar. We can talk about that later if you want. Rather, if anything, these texts seem to suggest seeds of the extra Calvinisticum, which states the divine nature of the Son remains as the second hypostasis of the one God, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent while incarnate. The Son's divine nature is hypostatically united to the human nature of Jesus of Nazareth, but still God in every sense. The fact that these texts affirm the effectiveness of Christ's descent precisely because he is both human and divine, without qualification, seem more in line with something like the extra Calvinisticum, or at least they seem more at odds than in concert with something like canonic Christology. Ignatius, uh, in Ignatius, uh, in uh, Letter to the Smyrnans 3.3, might be making such a statement, although it is unclear whether he's talking about the Son's divine nature or the human spirit of Jesus. Uh, similarly, Testament of Dan, teaching of Silvanus, Ascension of Isaiah, uh, all seem to affirm this. Ascension of Isaiah 10.11, for instance, says, And none of the angels of that world shall know that thou art with me of the seven heavens and of their angels. Here the Most High, the Father, declares that even though the Lord becomes incarnate, he will still be with the Father in heaven. And I'll, I'll just point that out again. None of the angels of that world shall know that thou art with me of the seven heavens. So there's this clear connection between him becoming a human being, but also still remaining with the Most High in heaven. In any case, what we find in these texts, it's not, it doesn't appear to be, to me, proto canonicism but I would say seeds that flower out into Chalcedonian Christology, emphasizing the hypostatic union, and perhaps even suggesting something like the extra. So by way of actual conclusion, what then can we conclude about the, the connection or lack of connection between second century writers' views of the descent and Trinitarian relations and the views of Balthazar. We should begin by noting that any conclusions related to later dogmatic formulations are necessarily tentative and always in danger of anachronism. This is why I keep saying the word seeds. Given these caveats, though, the first conclusion we can make is that these second century texts clearly affirm that the descent is effective because Christ is both human and God. We can also say that this union of divinity and humanity exists throughout Christ's work on earth, including in the descent. Further, the divine nature that is united to Jesus' human nature is that of the Son, or Lord, and is distinct from that of Father and Spirit. Rather than resulting in tritheism, though, these second century texts continue to affirm the unity of God and that there is only one God. What we might say, then, is that these second century descent texts contain the seeds for both the questions asked and the pro-Nicene Trinitarian formulations given as answers by the pro-Nicenes in the 4th and 5th centuries. We find in these texts hints of the one God and three person confession, a confession that gives rise to the Nicene controversies in the first place, and that from the pro-Nicene perspective resulted in doctrinal formulations such as the eternal relations of origin. We also find in the second century the seeds of Chalcedon, what with the emphasis on humanity and divinity united in the one person of Christ, the continuity of the incarnation throughout Christ's work, and the continued divine work and nature of the Son, even while incarnate. Of 
course, we should also note that there are statements in these second century texts that demand more explanation and possibly even repudiation given later pro-Nicene formulations. But perhaps, oddly enough, given how much people don't like the dissent today, the dissent passages are not among those considered more problematic given later Trinitarian orthodoxy. So while we might anachronistically ask whether or not these authors meet the later standards of Trinitarian orthodoxy with respect to those problematic passages, when it comes strictly to the dissent, they all exhibit the makings of proto-pro-Nicenes. Finally, to end where we began with Balthazar. While the great 20th century Catholic theologian may find precedent for his view elsewhere in the church, he is not warranted in finding it in these second century passages. Contrary to Balthazar, the second century writers surveyed above, while certainly disparate in their aims and situations and without influencing one another in any explicit way, still broadly affirm the, con the continuation of the incarnation and the descent, and thus the continued union of Christ's humanity and divinity. Further, in these second century texts, father and son are not separated in the descent, but rather the descent is affected because the son remains the son in every respect, still seated at the right hand of the Most High, even while descending to earth, and then hazed in human flesh. Father and son are not separated existentially or otherwise, only to be reunited by the love of the Spirit, but rather, as the one God, defeat death through the incarnate Son's descent into it in his human nature. The, the existentially canonic descent posited by Balthazar may find historical precedent elsewhere, but it does not find it in the second century. More study is needed in other centuries and theological streams to definitively prove or disprove Balthazar's claim on the tradition. Here we've only attempted to disprove it from the seminal century of Christian theological reflex reflection. Thank you. Hey, we are scheduled for